I remember when I was in college, the phrase attitude adjustment was very popular. And usually when we talked of an attitude adjustment, it was with a baseball bat or a tire iron. <clears throat> in our study of 1 Peter, we're encouraged to some attitude adjustments of our own, but without the threatening ways. We're going to look at uh, three attitude adjustments that can help us get through some difficult days. Peter opens the fourth letter of fourth chapter of this letter with these words. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Greek scholar Kenneth Wiest points out that the term translated arm yourselves that was used of a soldier that was putting on his armor taking up his weapons. What I think about is, is perhaps a, a soldier today putting on all the gear, making sure that his, his equipment is in working condition, or even a police officer getting ready to go on shift, putting on the bulletproof vest, making sure that you know, the, the weapons are loaded and, and locked and ready to go. Or even a fireman that's responding to a call and you put on the gear. You make sure that your air pack is on. You make sure it's got air in it. Uh, you make sure that everything is the way it needs to be. You prepare yourselves for whatever you might encounter out in the world. And if that's the idea here. The noun of this word is the same root used of a heavy armed foot soldier who carried a, a large a shield and, and like a pike, like a, a javelin kind of a weapon. The Christian needs the heaviest armor he can get to withstand the attacks of the enemy of our soul. But I don't think that Peter was thinking about shields and swords and, and spears when he wrote these words. He's talking about the weapons of attitudes. He says, arm yourself with this attitude. And that's going to be the focus of this message tonight. The attitude adjustments we make to be prepared for whatever life throws at us. Outlook determines outcome. And a believer needs to have the right attitudes if he's going to live the right life. And so let's take a look at Three specific attitudes that Peter mentions here that we may need to adjust in order to live the kind of life that Christ wants us to live. First, we need to adjust our attitude towards sin. At the end of verse 1, he says, Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. And then he goes on. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Peter is actually carrying over the same thought that we ended the third chapter with. He had written about the suffering of Jesus, that Jesus died once for all, the just for the unjust. And now he's applying that to the Christian's life. Since Jesus suffered in that way, we need to adopt maybe a different attitude, specifically regarding sin. Verse 1 says, he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Other translations render that cease to sin. We need to avoid two equally false conclusions from this verse. First of all, suffering in and of itself does not sanctify. Just because somebody goes through a difficult time, whether that's physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, Suffering in and of itself does not sanctify. Suffering gives us the opportunity 
to draw closer to God. We can become better people because we have suffered, or we can become bitter people. Same suffering can produce two different results. What makes the difference? The attitude. Our attitude toward our suffering. So, suffering in and of itself does not make us better people. It can be used by God to make us better people, but we must allow for that. And the other false conclusion that you might come to from this verse is that at some point in our earthly life, we're going to quit sinning. I wish that were true. I wish we could get to that point where I'm done with sin and I'm not going to sin anymore. You will find some people that make that claim. I haven't sinned in 30 years. Well, what they've done is they've redefined sin. And I would suggest you just did. <laughs> but it's because they've changed the definition of what they're, what they're talking about. Uh, we're not going to be sinless until we get to heaven. But remember, Peter is talking here about an attitude. Our attitude ought to be, I'm done with this. I don't need this. I don't have to do this anymore. And it's based on the truth that we find back in the book of Romans, chapter 6. So keep your finger here in Peter, because we'll be back. But Romans, chapter 6, gives us the basis for this change of attitude towards sin. Romans, chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul is writing here. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised to new life, raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with Him, then in His death we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. It's not that we are removed from sin because we still live in our sin-cursed bodies, we live in a sin-cursed world. But that power of sin has been broken. We are no longer slaves to sin. And that's the attitude we need to take to sin. To, towards sin. Now listen very carefully because I don't, I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm not excusing what people do when I say this, but people outside of Christ really can't help but sin. All right, In their sin nature, they are enslaved to it. Jesus said that himself. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. They don't have the power of the Spirit of God to resist temptation. And so they are going to sin. They're enslaved to it. From birth, we have a sin nature, and it dominates us. But when Christ comes in, that slavery is broken. That mastery over us is shattered. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are given the power to say no. Paul writes about that in Titus. He says, the grace of God has come, and it teaches us to say no to temptation. We can do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not automatic. We still have to choose to do right. We have to choose not to give in to temptation, but we have the power to do that. The person outside of Christ really doesn't. Why then do we still fall into sin? I think part of it might be our attitude towards sin. Because we believe in the grace of God, we believe in the forgiveness of God, we sing in our hymns how 
our sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. So, if I sin, eh, it's already been forgiven. If I mess up now and then, God's gracious, He understands. And if our attitude towards sin becomes lax, we start making excuses. We start relying on this idea that sin doesn't really matter. It's already taken care of. I don't have to worry about it anymore. What we fail to see is that our sin put Christ on the cross. And if we would adjust our attitude to recognize that every word, every act, even every thought that goes against God's standard caused Jesus incredible pain. I think about that haunting song that was recorded a number of years ago. Does he still feel the nails every time I fail? Can he hear the crowd cry crucify again? Am I causing him pain? Then I know I've got to change. I just can't bear the thought of hurting him. If that was our attitude towards sin, I think we'd sin a whole lot less. And we've kind of indicated that unbelievers sin because practically they have to. We sin because we choose to. We have the power, we have the ability to not sin, and yet we still sin. And it's because we choose to. Peter is saying here we need to be done with sin. In verse 3, he uses a Greek tense that the course is closed and done. It, it's, a, it's a fact of the past. It's a closed matter. We don't keep going back to it, going back over it. Remember the words of Jesus in Luke 9.62. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is worthy of the kingdom of God. Leave the past in the past and move forward. Don't relish in that life of previous sin. Now, not only does it affect uh, the way we look back, it also affects the way we look forward. No one knows the time Christ will come back or when our individual lives on this earth will end. Time is a very precious commodity. And Peter writes in verse 2 that the Christian does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. If we do the will of God, then we really are investing the rest of our time in that which is eternal, that which will last, and that which will ultimately satisfy. But if we're giving in to the world, we're going to waste the rest of our time on earth, and we're going to regret it when we stand before Jesus. I'm not suggesting you're going to lose your salvation. What I am saying is we're going to lose the reward. We're going to stand before Jesus and He's going to say, how did you invest the time that I gave you after you came to know me? And there are going to be some people that will have absolutely nothing to show for it because they invested the rest of their life in the things of earth and it's all going to burn up. So looking back at our past sin, it's done. Be done with it. Looking ahead toward eternity with God, let's invest that time doing what's right, not what do, is doing what's wrong. So it's the hope of Christ's return that really inspires us to a better life. Now there's a second attitude that needs adjusting. The first had to do with sin. The second has to do with sinners. Look at verses 4 through 6 back in 1 Peter chapter 4. They, speaking of unbelievers, they think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. 
For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. The Apostle moves from the sin of our past to the sinners of the present. He knows that when a person comes to Christ, it's going to radically change and affect our relationships. Those friends that we always hung out with, they're not going to understand why we won't indulge with them, why we don't go with them to the bar after work or to the weekend parties or or jumping from one partner to another. They're not going to appreciate even our silent witness against their sin. Even the fact we don't participate with them, they're going to take as an affront. They don't like our lives shining a light on what they're doing. They'd rather remain in the dark. And that's why, in Peter's words, they will heap abuse on you. They're going to make your life difficult. They're going to try to make you miserable. Because you're not going along with them. You're standing out from the crowd, and and they don't like that. And it's at this point we've got to be careful. We need to be careful that we don't adopt the same attitude towards sinners that we do towards sin. talked about this this morning when Jesus talked with the woman at the well. Here was a woman whose lifestyle was very sinful. But Jesus didn't adopt the same attitude toward her as he did her sin. And that's what we're called to do as well. If I were to summarize the first three verses of this chapter, our attitude towards sin, I would say be militant. Stand up against sin. Resist it. Resist temptation. Don't allow yourself to be caught up into it. But unfortunately, we often take the same mindset toward unbelievers. And they see us as charging toward them threateningly. We're not to be militant toward unbelievers. We're actually to be merciful. When you run into these people that don't know Christ... They're indulging in a lifestyle that we know is against God's Word. Don't beat them up for their lifestyle. No one ever got saved because they were rebuked for drinking or shamed for taking drugs or sleeping around. If you think about it, it's surprising that the pagan world isn't doing more of those things to try to fill the void in their lives. They don't know Christ. They don't have the freedom of forgiveness. They don't have that relationship with God and with God's people. It's not our point to make an issue of their lifestyle. They don't have a power to stop that. They're enslaved to sin. What we need to do is to let grace and mercy flow toward them. As I mentioned this morning, God is the judge. Satan is the prosecutor. We don't need to fill either one of those roles. What we're called to do is be a witness of what God has done in our lives. And the way we do that is with gentleness and respect, with love and compassion. People are loved into the kingdom. They're not nagged into the kingdom. They're not judged into the kingdom. So the attitude we have towards sin needs to be different than the attitude we have towards sinners. We talk an awful lot about Loving sinners and hating sin. And it it is so important. But it's a very difficult balance to maintain. It's a whole lot easier to go to the extreme of either I'm going to love the sinner so I'll I'll accept whatever they do or I hate their sin, I'm going to hate them too. Those are the easy extremes. It's finding that balance that's very difficult, but that's what we're called to do. Now, before we leave this, I do want to briefly comment on verse 6. Peter says, For this reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. And some people combine this with the verse we saw in chapter 3 about the spirits in prison and conclude that some unbelievers are going to get a second chance. They died without Christ, but 
in His grace and mercy, God's going to give them a second chance to receive Jesus. That's not what this is teaching at all. The Bible is very, very clear. In Hebrews 9.27, it says, We are destined to die once, and after that, the judgment. There are no second chances. When he talks about those, even those who are now dead, he's talking about people who have already died that were Christians. People that his recipients would have known. This is why the gospel was preached to them. They had been condemned by men. Some of them had lost their lives because of their faith, but they were commended by God. So he's not teaching here about a second chance for salvation. He's talking about Christians who had already died at the time he wrote this letter. And then finally, we're challenged to adjust our attitude towards service. Look at verses 7 through 11. Peter writes, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality toward one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks... He should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The motivation is given in the beginning of verse 7. The end of all things is near. I read that verse and I always think of the guy standing on the Street corner, you know, with the placard, the end is near, you know. Always wondered how effective that testimony was. Probably not a whole lot. But what he's talking about here is putting this element of hope in the forefront. We know what's coming. We know that ultimately Christ will return. And all Christians will be resurrected and transformed. We will stand before Him, so we ought to live our lives in a certain way, and in a word that is service. First, the attitude is addressed. The King James renders verse 6, be sober. In this context, we're not talking about the opposite of intoxication. He's not saying don't get drunk. He's saying be sober and the meaning of this word in the original language is the opposite of frenzy, maddening kind of extremism. In fact, the opposite of this word in the Greek is mania. And we understand that in a mental health way. Someone may be manic depressive, and in that times of mania, it's they're frenzied, they're, it's their, their mind can't stop. They're, they're just, there's so many thoughts going on in their mind and, and, and they're, they're just in a frenzy. And Peter is saying, as our lives, we ought to be the opposite of that. We don't need to be in a frenzy. We can face life realistically, free of delusions. We're going to have a purpose to our life. We're not just going to drift without aim. We can exercise restraint. We don't have to be impulsive. Because again, part of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. He also uses that word, be self-controlled. And through the Spirit of God, we can do that. And that will lead us to prayer. Notice he says, be sober, be self-controlled so that you can pray. When you see someone that's all full of anxiety, when they're on the ragged ed edge of extremism, all out of sorts, you're probably looking at someone that needs to pray. Because Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. And when we do that, the peace of God comes and sets up a guard for our hearts and our minds. That's a military word. 
He will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The antidote to worry and anxiety is prayer. When we pray, that worry, that anxiety is replaced with the peace of God that goes beyond human comprehension. And that is a powerful testimony to others. If I can borrow from Rudyard Kipling, if you keep your head while everyone else is losing theirs, they're going to wonder why. How can you keep it together? And it gives you a great opportunity to say, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what God has done in my life. Another attitude adjustment is love. Not just love, but love deeply and fervently. The idea of an athlete, uh, a runner in a race that's straining to get to that finish line before everybody else. It takes effort, discipline, and focus. It's not just a warm, fuzzy feeling. That's not the love the Bible talks about. This is an action, and it takes commitment. It takes effort. One particular aspect of love mentioned here is forgiveness. You see here, love co covers a multitude of sins. What's that mean in practical terms? We're not talking about condoning sin. If we truly love someone, we're going to be grieved when we see their, their sin and how it hurts them and hurts others. But when he says love covers sin, it's that we're not spreading it ab abroad. We're not broadcasting it to the whole world because that's the way of the world you ever notice how much of the news talks about scandal and you know don henley had it right the media is all about dirty laundry because everybody wants to hear and see the dirty laundry you know we we want to know about you know the the tragedy we want to know about the, the scandal. We, we want to hear the bad news. That's, that's the way of the world. And it's part of our nature. And when we hear that somebody else has fallen into sin or they're going through a tough time, the temptation is, oh, I want to go tell somebody about this. Why? Because it makes us look better. Oh, look at that poor soul. I'm sure glad it isn't me. I'm glad I'm not going through that. It's really a, a psychological way of building ourselves up by tearing other people down. And Peter is saying, don't do that. We're not trying to hide sin from the eyes of God, because that's impossible. We're not trying to tell the person what they're doing is okay. We're not condoning their actions. What we're doing is, let's keep it in-house. A bit like that passage from 1 Corinthians 6 we talked about earlier. If there needs to be confrontation, let's do it privately. If a Christian brother or sister needs to be corrected, let's do it behind closed doors. It doesn't have to be broadcast to the whole church or the whole community. That's the way in which love covers a multitude of sins. There's a great example of this in the life of Noah. This is a story you don't hear about in Sunday school, thankfully. <clears throat> After the flood... After he built the ark and the flood comes and then the flood recedes and they get back to living. We're told that Noah had a vineyard. And in the process of time he made wine and he got drunk. And he was laying naked in his tent. And they even had more of an aversion towards nudity then than we do now. And two of his sons... When they realized what had happened, it says they took a, a garment or a blanket or something. They held it between them and they walked backward into the tent, covering their father's nakedness so that they wouldn't see it themselves. That's exactly what Peter is talking about here. We don't need all the juicy details. We don't need to be gossiping about what other people are doing. Even when you think it's so other people can pray more efficiently. Now, that's gossip. We don't really need to know all the details. Face it, it's none of our business. We can pray for them without dredging up all the filth. And that's what Peter is talking about here. Then he mentions the gift of hospitality in verse 9. Women's Study Bible calls this the gift of welcome. It's welcoming, sheltering, feeding, with no thought of personal gain. Those who come to our door. 
You know, we're not talking about elegant menus and elaborate table setting. You, know, you don't have to be Martha Stewart here. Okay? That, that's not the idea. It's more of an attitude of opening our hearts, opening our homes. You know, hospitality is, is kind of a lost art in this day. And the key to hospitality is flexibility. How flexible are we with our home, with our material goods? How about even our time? You know, we probably don't think about hospitality in terms of time, but that's a way we can open ourselves to someone in need. You, know, you get a phone call and caller ID tells you who it is, and you think to yourself, do I really have an hour to give to this person right now? When we're hospitable, we welcome them into our lives. Doesn't mean necessarily have to, they're at your door, literally. But even giving them time, giving them your attention, your consideration, that's being hospitable. That's serving others. And it's just one way we provide service to each other. Peter encourages all of us to find a way to serve within the body of Christ. It's not identical. You know, some people are more out front. They have speaking gifts. Others have more serving gifts that are behind the scenes. But they're all equally important. And when it's done with the correct attitude, the church body will benefit and the Lord will be blessed. The church will shine in the community as a light in the darkness, really showing the world how God intended life to be. William Barclay concludes, the Christian believer is a man who has the Lord's example behind him and the hope of glory in front of him. By these two things, the tone and the character of his life is dominated and dictated. All through the letter, there runs this constant sense of the obligation and the responsibility which the mercy and grace of the love of God and Jesus Christ has laid upon the Christian. Yes, we live in the love, the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy of Christ. We, we revel in it. We sing about it. It makes us feel so good. But that's also the way in which we should live. Not only do we receive His love and grace and mercy, but it should flow through us to the people around us. Outside the church, inside the church. We ought to be a source of God's grace and mercy. So what about us? Are we in need of an attitude adjustment? With regard to sin, we need to be militant as we close the door to our old lives and leave it behind. With regard to sinners, we need to be merciful as we relate to them, not as the enemy, but as helpless hostages who need to be rescued from the real enemy. And with regard to service, we need to be magnanimous, putting others before ourselves and our Lord above all. And then no matter what happens, whether the Lord returns or if we're ushered into His presence through death, we will be ready to stand before God and give account for our lives. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Father, thank You for the practical, the practical words we find in Scripture, how we are to live our lives. Thank You for the love, the mercy, and the grace that has been shown toward us I pray that we might be able to show it toward others. May the world see Christ in us so that when we tell them about Jesus, they're ready to hear it, they're ready to believe it. Do your work in our lives. Adjust our attitudes as needed so that we will live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.